This morning's lesson, government and grace. Now, some may think that's a contradiction. (laughs) Some may try to argue that since we're under grace and not the law, that there should be no government at all. Now, of course, if you think about it, those are probably the same people who also believe that grace is a license to sin freely without reproach. (laughs) But a fuller understanding of the Word of God will clear up both of these fallacies. Now, last week's lesson uh, covered the passage from Galatians chapter 3 concerning the law and schoolmasters. Now, I believe this lesson will touch on it again, but before we get there, I want to take that passage just one step further. Now, in uh, in the passage from Galatians, Paul's applying this to the Jews under the law, but it still applies to Christians under grace today. I've spoken of it before in different ways concerning the doctrine of the church and our advice to members. When, When you were first saved, you didn't instantly and miraculously know everything that you know right now. Even if you're only recently saved, you still know more about God's will today than you did then. The government of the church works in such a way as to help guide us into a deeper walk with God. It helps us to see when we're getting too close to the world. And it helps us to know the path all of us must take in order to draw closer to God and receive more from Him. Salvation does not remove the ability to sin. It simply softens our hearts to the will of God and causes us to desire to please Him. Just something we never had before salvation. Those of us who have been saved and then fallen short of God's will can attest to the truth of that statement. It's a miserable feeling to know that you failed God after He did so much for you. Now salvation, it strengthens our resolve to draw closer to God and to receive the power that we need to cling to His will through temptation and not give in. If we respect the government of the church, we will learn the importance of submission. Submission is critical to our Christian walk. This will help us to understand the need for sanctification. Once that sinful nature is crucified, we will have a much greater ability to resist that temptation. But our human nature remains, keeping us from being totally invulnerable to Satan's devices. All the while, the church government helps to keep that human nature in check. When we meditate on God's Word, we'll begin to realize that the government of the church is there to help us. It's there to to guide us, to lead us, to to give us the understanding of... Once again, I just said a few minutes ago, if you're only recently saved, how is it that you now know what you didn't know the moment you are saved through the government of the church. The government instructs us that it's important that we spend time in God's Word. It's important that we spend time in prayer. It's important that we spend time in fellowship with other Christian believers so that, so that we can grow in our understanding of God's will. Now, this is the extent of our responsibility as, as new children in the Lord, but it's part of our responsibility and it's part of the government of the church to help us and and lead us and guide us in the paths that we should take. Because we don't know everything as soon as we're saved. Through the government, we understand the importance of keeping our eyes on Jesus. And all of this will help us to desire God's Spirit to dwell within us. Jesus said in John chapter 14, verses 15 through 17, If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and He shall give you another Comforter, that He may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth Him not. Neither knoweth Him, but ye know Him, for He dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. Now, something that people often overlook, the Spirit is with us. From the moment 
we first experienced His conviction power. He's there by our side. He's leading us. He's guiding us. But at that time, His, his influence, His guidance is only external to us. So He's leading us. And so He says, come this way. And we have the opportunity to say, yeah, I don't think so. I'm going to go this way. We're, we're, we, we have less of a, a tendency to, to follow Him when He's just leading from the outside. But when He dwells within us, He will have a far greater influence over our souls. He will be able to touch our hearts in a way that He couldn't when He was outside of us, simply leading us and guiding us from without. And the church government... That they're guiding us. The government of the church is guiding us to this place where we can receive this guidance from the Spirit. And when we allow the Spirit to take control, all the doctrines, all the advice will no longer have any sway over us. We don't need a list when the Spirit dwells within us to please the Lord because the Spirit is dwelling in us and He will guide us in those things that please the Lord. We won't have to check, well, yeah, I did this today, I did this today. I followed, yep, the 29 teachings. I did all of them today, so I'm perfect. That's not perfection. What we had been instructed to do through the government of the church, it becomes our heart's desire. The government instructs us to follow the advice to members. It instructs us to, to obey the 29 teachings, and these things are good and right. And when we don't have the Spirit leading us, we need something to tell us what is it that God expects of us because we don't have the Spirit dwelling in us. But when the Spirit dwells within us, those things come automatically. Through the direction of the Spirit, we will desire a deeper, to go deeper than any direction that the government could give us. Now, that doesn't mean that the government is no longer necessary. In fact, it's only when we are filled with the Spirit that we can truly see the full benefit of the government. Because then we see what led us to that place in our lives. So the government kind of like a schoolmaster. It's exactly what I'm saying. The government, it's, the law was a schoolmaster to the Israelites to lead them to the Messiah. The government of the church is it works in the same way to lead us to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit so we're no longer under the confines of the 29 teachings and the advice to members. That doesn't mean that we're no longer responsible to obey them. As a matter of fact, we'll go in above and beyond that because we'll recognize, you know, this is something in my life that I need to avoid. The Bible doesn't say it's a sin. The church doesn't say it's a sin. I don't think it's sinful. But this thing has a potential to draw me away from the Lord hobby, a particular friend or family member who, who may be leading you in a bad direction. could be anything. It, but we have to be sensitive to the Spirit in, in those respects. And the that's the point of the government, to take us to that place. Are you going to say something? It's amazing that once you get there, the, the, the government and the grace of God, it, it brings such satisfaction and Absolutely. in your life. Absolutely. The, the, the two working together. And here are my notes. So just as the law led the Jews to Christ, so the church government leads the church, leads us to freedom, the freedom of walking in the Spirit. When we're able, then, only then, we're able to help lead others to that same place by our good examples and godly behavior, which will all fall under the authority of the government through grace. So just because we, we have received the Holy Spirit doesn't mean that we're no, longer, we're, we're no longer under the government. We're still a part of the government. And it's our responsibility as Spirit-filled individuals to lead those, to guide those, to allow the government of the church to work through us to be a blessing to them, to help them to rise up to the same place as we are. It's, it's never the responsibility of the church to press others down whether inside the church or outside of the church. But it's always our responsibility to lift others up to where we are and seek others and seek the Lord to, to be lifted up ourselves to a closer walk with Him. Not to be lifted up in pride, but to li be lifted up in humility 
in, in, our close, in the closeness of our walk to God. Simple point of fact here. If two people who both claim to be filled with the Holy Spirit are at odds with one another, button heads, well, you have to consider the fact that either one of them or both of them are not being led by the Spirit. We need to remember this for ourselves, for our own benefit, and not automatically assume that if someone disagrees with us, that they're the ones who are wrong. If we have that Spirit, eh, the Spirit of God's not the one dwelling, leading us. That's our own flesh that's leading us. The government will always have us to check ourselves first. If we have the Spirit in us, we will always check ourselves first before we go pointing fingers at others saying they're in the wrong. Jesus prayed in John 17, 21. This is deep. This is powerful. People overlook it every single day. John 17, 21, Jesus said, that they all may be one. He's talking about the church, believers. As thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. Hold it. Now think about that. Really let that sink in. How are you and you and you and you and you and you and me supposed to be? We're supposed to be one. Oh yes, oh yes, brother, we're the church. We're one. No. I'm not supposed to be one with you like my brother and I. We're, 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 we, have a lot, we have a similar upbringing, so we're, we're closer than the rest of you. So we're kind of one. Well, I don't know, Sister Parton, I, I appreciate you. You've been an encouragement to me since I started coming here at Southside. We're, we're kind of different, but we're, we're still kind of one. Wendy, I've been married to you for nearly 30 years. We've been together for nearly 30 years. I, I have a better, closer relationship with you than I do to anybody in this building. We're kind of one too. That's not what he's talking about. That's not what he's saying. Jesus said... As thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, so they, us, may be one in God and Jesus. So the same way that God, the Father, and God the Son are one, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are one, Jesus is expecting us through this prayer to have that kind of unity. Well, I, Sister Parton, I agree with you on 90% of this stuff, but not 100. No, that's not unity. There is no disagreement between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There is no animosity between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There is no division whatsoever in any way, shape, or form at all. That is what Jesus prayed for us. Okay to disagree. Is that saying <laughs> agree, to agree to disagree? Yeah. But the Bible says, "How can two walk together except that they agree?" That, they agree. that really contradicts what the Word of God says. Though. Absolutely. If we are truly walking in the Spirit, now according to Jesus' prayer, if we're truly walking in the Spirit, we, we as humans, will have the same unity as the Trinity. Yes. Yes. We need to understand that. We as individuals, we as the church, not just in this local congregation, worldwide, we need to have that understanding of what it was that Jesus truly prayed for. Not just that we agree, yes, 29 teachings, they're good. Advice to members, yeah, they're good. We're not even there yet. We can't even agree on the government of the church. God is expecting us to be one with Him the same way that the Trinity is unified. And until we all come to that place in the Spirit, well, what's the end of that? The end of that Scripture is the most important part. That the world may believe that Thou hast sent me. 
So why is it that we're supposed to be one like all that that I just described? It's that unity that will show those outside the church that we are who we say we are. To me, that sounds pretty important. If we want to lead others to Christ, if the government of the church, if the intention is, is to lead others to a perfect understanding of God's will for their lives, we're going to have to get ourselves straightened out. We're going to have to get ourselves in order. I'm going to have to be one with each and every one of you in the same way the Father and the Son are one. That's, that's serious unity. That's the unity that we, sh we should be striving for. Not, I don't like this and, and I don't like the way you do that. But Lord, I'm submitted to you and your will be done in my life. If that means that I have to do this or I don't get to do that, you're still God. And I'm going to be uni in unity with you these around me because they're the ones whom you've placed in my life. And these are the ones whom you prayed, Jesus prayed, that we would have that same unity as the Trinity. I don't think that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost ever disagreed about anything. And if we're being truly led by the Spirit, if we are truly being led by the Spirit, neither will we. When we disagree... We allow Satan to drive wedges between us and show the world that we have nothing to do with the God whom we claim to serve. It's only by our unity that the lost will see us for those whom God would have us to be, and then they'll be drawn to us, and they'll be drawn to Him. By the direction of the Spirit of God, it is the responsibility of the government of the church to lead newcomers to a deeper walk with God that will culminate in perfect unity of believers and draw others to God in the process. That's why we're here. We're not here simply, oh, Lord's return's coming. I better, get, I better sit back and get ready. No, it's our responsibility to be unity with one another and draw others to the power of God. Draw others to the Spirit by way of the government. That's the responsibility of the government. Getting into the lesson here. Actual commentary. The subject before us is closely related to the previous lesson on the covenant of grace. There is a continued need of government in the church, even while we live under grace rather than the law. Webster defines government as the exercise of authority over an organization, institution, state, district, etc. Control, rule, management. In the church's government, God is the authority who directs, controls, and rules. For the righteous, government becomes more of a protection for the obedient who are often victims of the lawless and disobedient, according to 1 Timothy 1, 9, and 10. Now, Jesus, Paul, and Jude, as well as others, warned of those who would creep in among us. Through deceit and guile, they weasel their way in where they don't belong. Now, we may be personally responsible, uh, uh, personally aware of some who, in our own day, have sought out positions of power to sway the gullible in their direction. Here we see another valuable asset of the Spirit of God dwelling within us. Hmm, that sounds strange. What, what, what am I talking about? It's the power of discernment. It's only available through the Spirit. The government is responsible to be sensitive enough to the Spirit to see through their ruse and expose these individuals for who they are. Now this is, exposure is not simply for their embarrassment, but it's to help them understand the dangers of the path that they've chosen for themselves. Only full surrender to God will achieve the eternal goal that we should be seeking. Yes, the government is in place to help the spiritually weak, lead them to closer walk with God. Not only those who are babes in Christ, but also those who have unknowingly allowed themselves to become agents of the enemy from within the church. At the same time, government serves to keep the pure minds of the saints sensitive 
to the blessings which grace affords. Now by submitting ourselves to the godly government of the church, we come under the protection of God Himself. If we choose to oppose the government, we're not opposing man. We're not opposing people or individuals. But we're opposing the God who appointed these individuals to those positions. Now, it is an important that we like those individuals. There have been plenty of people I didn't, I didn't much care for their preaching style. I didn't much care for their, their leading style. But because they were appointed over me, I respected their responsibility. And I was obedient to them. Not because I agreed with them, but because I recognized them as being put in place by God. That's what theocracy is. We're talking about the government here. But it's important to remember that it is God who put them in their positions and has allowed them to remain to this point. Paul tells us in Romans 13, 1 and 2, let every soul be subject, that is, submitted to the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, the authority, the responsibility of those people in, in, in a ministry over us, they resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist, now listen to this, they that resist receive to themselves damnation. If you resist the government under grace, you receive to yourselves damnation. That's the Word of God. That's not my opinion. That's not what the church says. That's what the Bible says. When we go against those who have been placed in authority over us, we're not simply a going against that individual. We're not simply denying them the authority that, that's been granted them. <clears throat> but we're resisting God. And we're looking for the damnation of our own souls. Men may try to politic for power, but only God has the ability <clears throat> to place them in the positions of authority or to bring them down from those positions. I think about this in the Old Testament. After the people murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness, we read in Exodus 16 and 8, Moses said, The Lord heareth your murmurings, which ye murmur against Him. And who are we? Your murmurings aren't against us, but against the Lord. So when we complain about those who God has placed over us, and whether we like it or not, Nobody comes into a position of power we just read except God allow it to be so. Now that applies to within the church, that applies to the local government, that applies to national governments. There is no power. It doesn't say there is no church power. It doesn't say there is no national power. It says there is no power except that which is allowed by God. God puts them in place. And I'm not, not a big fan of Putin right now. But God has a plan. God knows what He's doing. We may not understand. We may question His, His logic, His reason. But God knows what He's doing. I don't like what's going on. But God knows what He's doing. And if we trust Him, He'll work it for His glory. In that situation, if we trust Him in that, why can we not trust Him within the church of God to place leaders over us whom we can respect, even if we don't agree with them. Like I said, I, I, I've, not, I've had people over me in the Lord that I, I didn't agree with. But God put them in place. And I recognize that it was God who put them there, and it will be God who takes them out. Nothing I do or say is going to hurt them, but it has potential to destroy me. Who are we? that we would murmur against God. I think of Judas, because he was, but he was the son of perdition. He had a purpose. He mm -hmm. fulfilled it. His end was a, you know, a bad one, but he was. And he chose you know, it. Yeah. God knew before, before time began that he would choose that path. Mm -hmm. But we, 
When, but when we are obedient to those whom the Lord has set over us, we'll be blessed. Even if those over us are seeking their own personal ambition. Even if they receive a curse for the choices that they've made. We will be blessed by our submission. Now clearly, I'm not talking about doing things that are sinful. But I'm talking about submitting ourselves to their authority within the confines of the direction of understanding of the government of the church. Sometimes we make the greatest error of taking the authority, God's authority, into our hands. Absolutely. That's the greatest error you could possibly make. <laughs> Absolutely. The intent of the government is to protect the citizens from the enemy without and from the enemy within. If we remain subject to the government, it will work for our benefit and God's glory. If we rebel, it will only work our own destruction. And because of that bickering and infighting that people see outside the church, it will only hinder those souls from seeking the truth and finding it. So where's the benefit? Is there any benefit to anybody when we butt heads with the government of God. There is none. Peter's second epistle begins with such a reminder. Verses 12 and 13 indicate that even though we know these things, keeping them always in remembrance helps to establish us in the truth. Though our minds may be pure, there is still the devil with whom we have to contend. The directive restraints of government help us to remember when our human nature tends to forget. We tend to be forgetful at those times when we feel offended. If we feel offended, we, we kind of throw off the, the restraints of the government and seek to vindicate our own selves. And, and I think uh, Brother, Brother Pulliam uh, touched on that just a moment ago talking about when we, when we take God's the things that are only to be in God's hands, and we try to take those ourselves and use them. It's, it's not our responsibility. Even God said in one place, vengeance is mine. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, I'll saith the Lord. You don't worry about what they're doing. Right. And what did Jesus say when, when uh, Peter, talking to, Peter talking to Jesus, Jesus, Peter said, well, what about this guy? What's that to me? What's that to you? If he's, if he's supposed to live another thousand years, what's that to you? You follow me. We don't need to worry about what anyone else may or may not do, what anyone else may or may not think, feel, decide to, to do. Our responsibility is keep our eyes on God. I don't need to worry about what sister or brother so-and-so is doing. Our responsibility, our personal responsibility within the church, if you're not a minister who's, who's in authority over these individuals to help lead them and guide them in the right direction, if you're just a brother and sister in the Lord, your responsibility is to keep your eyes on Jesus. Now, a pastor, if he sees something out of line, he's been placed in that position by the government of the church to see to that situation. If he sees something going on in an individual, it's his responsibility to say something about it in love, to do something about it, whatever's necessary, whether it be uh, direction, protection, guidance, uh, worst case scenario, uh, speak to them about the possibility of them losing their membership if they continue in their behavior. But all of these things have been assigned as his responsibility as the pastor. He doesn't have any responsibility over Zion Hill. Brother Pulliam, you go over to Zion Hill, you have no authority. That's outside your jurisdiction. We're talking about government here. You have your sphere of influence that, that God has placed you under. If you see something going on at Zion Hill, yeah, you, you probably could tell Brother Anders about it. Say, you know, I, I saw brother, saw sister so-and-so, heard this, heard that. But that's the extent of anything you could do. You have no authority to speak to that individual as far as a pastor. You speak to them in love. We all have the responsibility to be a blessing one to another. But our responsibility, number one, is to keep our eyes on God. Not talk about people for what they do. Not, not 
usurp authority that doesn't belong to us. We're talking about government here. But to recognize who we are in God's sight and be fully submitted to Him. I'm not even the golden truth yet. Golden truth. Hebrews 13 and 7. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the out the end of their conversation. Now, when you truly think about it, the responsibility placed upon the ministry. But now, when you truly think about the responsibility placed upon the ministry, may we have a greater respect for the work that they do. Our everlasting souls are their responsibility. If they fail to warn us properly and we succumb to the enemy, God says that our blood is on their hands. And Brother Pullum, if you don't tell me when I, when I do something wrong and I die in sin, you're responsible. That's serious. Ezekiel 33 and 6, the whole chapter is, well, probably the first two-thirds of the chapter is talking about Ezekiel being a watchman. Ezekiel 33 and 6, But if the watchman see the sword come, the enemy's coming, and blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity. But his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. Just as our own pastor is today, God set Ezekiel as a watchman over the people of Israel. The pastor or bishop or overseer may live a perfect life of godliness. Yet if he fails to warn those who may be falling short or slipping away from the truth, then according to this passage from Ezekiel, he is just as guilty as if he had killed them himself. This is a serious responsibility. We need to think about this next time we decide to butt heads with a one who minister who's over us in the Lord. This is serious. No minister enjoys discipline. But it's a part of the calling and election of God for those in authority. When we realize this, may it help us to respect their positions more as well as being submissive to them, submitting ourselves to them, to their guidance that they offer along the way. We will only benefit through our obedience and respect for the government leaders whom God has seen fit to place over us in the church. Lesson commentary. Part 1. Church government. Prophetic fulfillment. Part A. The gov governor. Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. The church in the wilderness was a type and shadow, but not the fulfillment. Isaiah prophetically introduced the promised Christ as the government, governor. But when the fullness of time, the time was come, God sent forth His Son, that is, Galatians 4 and 4. According to God's Word, through His prophets, His true government would be established on His shoulder, representing Christ's body, or the church, of which He is the head. Now we often forget what was pointed out earlier, that rebellion against God's minister is actually rebellion against God. Jesus is the head of the body. Most of us would never think of refusing instruction from Jesus, yet we rarely think twice about ignoring the direction of our earthly leaders when we don't like it, when it doesn't appeal to us. We might even get upset if a flaw is pointed out, if our own flaw is pointed out by a minister in private in hopes that we might acknowledge our failure so that we can draw closer to God. They are as much an instrument in the hand of God as the power of conviction. Why would we respect one and brush off the other? We show our disrespect for God when we refuse godly counsel or a choice of appointment from a church leader. 
How this type of be- how will this type of behavior benefit anyone in the end? I've not agreed with every appointment that's been made at any level. <laughs> I didn't agree with the appointment that was made for make me a P teacher. But I su- yeah, <laughs> praise the Lord. But I submit. I submitted to the authority of the one who was over me who placed me in this position. And even though I wasn't a good teacher for a long time, and I I know I was a bad teacher for quite a while because I've spoken of it before. I I read the lesson. And then we'd sit and talk for the rest of the 40 minutes of class. It only takes about seven minutes to read through a lesson. The long ones might take eight, ten. So we just sit and talk about what's going on. That's a horrible teacher. But eventually, God got through to me and said, you know, I've given you this responsibility. This person didn't give you this responsibility. Oh, you know, I I probably need to do something. I don't think I'm a perfect teacher. I don't know that I'm a good teacher. But I'm a faithful teacher. I recognize the responsibility that's been given to me, and I do what I can to bring out what it is that God would have me to bring out in each lesson. I try to seek His will so that I understand what it is that God would have me to say. Because each congregation is different. The same lesson is being read in hundreds of churches, at least, over the different time zones, throughout the country, around the world. Each congregation is different. The individuals that make up each congregation are different. And God knows that these lessons are the same. So how is it that each individual, each congregation receives what they need? The government of the church works in such a way that each teacher is responsible to find God's will. I've been placed in this position to find God's will for whoever it is that shows up. we got people who, who wouldn't normally be here this morning. They'd be in a completely different church. But they're here today. God knew that. I didn't have any idea. We got three people I don't normally see on Sunday morning. I'm familiar with them. I know them. It's not always the case. But it's my responsibility as the teacher to find God's will. And I don't know what it is. I have to seek Him for it. And I have to be honest with you, when I started studying this lesson, I never saw anything. When I sat down to actually gather my thoughts, which is usually what I do, I'll read through the lesson through the week, and then Friday night, I'll sit down and I'll gather my thoughts and write them all down, get my notes together. I sat down Friday, and I looked at the lesson title. I got nothing. I got absolutely nothing. I don't see anything in here, Lord. You're going to have to, you're really going to have to help me with this because I don't see anything there. And God said, Here you go. This is what you're to bring for. I don't know who it's for. I just know this is what God gave me. I don't know if this applies to everybody who's sitting here. I don't know if this applies to one person. I don't know if it just applies to me. But whatever it is, The government of the church has placed me in a position to find God's will and do it. Understanding the authority of God like this Mm -hmm. is something we need to tap into. Mm -hmm. I was was searching for scripture, but in uh, in, in the uh, uh, Sermon on the Mount, at the end of it, 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 the word says, He spoke of one having authority. Mm -hmm. It was different than, than what anybody had ever heard of. Before. Right. And the, the centurion soldier, you know, mm-hmm. he understood what authority was. Yeah. He had some over him. He mm-hmm. had some under him. He said, I, I tell this one, go, I'll, you know, and he goes. Mm-hmm. He said, I understand authority, but just speak the word. Yep. yep. That's, the, that's power. That's, that's faith. That's serious faith. I'm... I'm just going to read my notes. i got like nine minutes left, so we'll see where we get. Um, the order of the government, part B, Isaiah 9 and 7, of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. 
We see the governmental authority in Mark 13.34, which, though concise, describes the church's order from the day of His ascension, Jesus' ascension, until now. Mark 13.34, For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey, who left his house and gave authority to his servants. That's government. Gave authority to his servants and to every man his work and commanded the porter to watch. He laid down the government right there. He said, okay, I'm going away, but my government is still going to continue on. You are in charge of the government from here out. You will follow the directives that I've already established. Jesus left His house, and when He did, He appointed those who would be responsible for its upkeep until He returned. Now, this should give us a clear understanding of at least two aspects of the church. First, Jesus set, in, set His church in order before His crucifixion, or else He wouldn't have been able to leave His house. You can't leave something that doesn't exist. Second, He placed His authority on those whom He left behind to do the work of the church in His absence. That's government. That church is still operating in that manner today. Amen. And His authority still rests on those whom He is calling to this modern day work of that same house as we await His return. Now, Jesus speaking of His return said in Matthew 24, 45 through 51, Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his house, to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant, whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you, that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But, and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour when he is not aware of, and shall cut him in sunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Once again, this is a serious responsibility which is placed upon the ministers within the church. Then we see its development ministerially and functionally in 1 Corinthians 12, 28. And God hath set some in the church for first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. And Ephesians 8, 4, 8 through 16. Wherefore he saith, when he ascendeth upon high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying, building up of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into Him in all things which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working of the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto an edifying of itself in love." <clears throat> Now, the purpose of the ministry, government, is to prepare for Christ's return. And we all work to be blessings one to another. If we don't respect the ministry, we're not going to make it. If we don't do the work, if we don't work to edify one another, we are falling short in our duties to God. The ministry is a guide. They're not armed guards, but loving servants. They can't force us to toe the line. But when we refuse their guidance, we work our own destruction and we hinder souls from seeing the power of the truth working in and through us. If this is our behavior, will we be found faithful at His return? 
part C. Mm. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us, Acts 15, 28, end of that last paragraph. In Acts 15, we see theocracy in vivid operation. And we also need to understand the proper order in which we see this written. First, it seemed good to the Holy Ghost. And only after he had set his approval on the situation could the body of believers agree to the decision that God had already made. Now, if we get the cart before the horse, we are very likely to miss the will of God altogether. If it seems good to us first, we may just assume that the Holy Ghost agrees with us rather than waiting on His guidance for the situation at hand. We must not get ahead of the Lord. It is the duty of the government to find the will of God and then pursue it with all that we are. The church is not without disciplinary provisions and authority under government. Once again, when we were saved and introduced to the church, we were bound to mechanically obey the doctrine advice because we knew that these things had been sought out and sought and dug out by those who had gone before us as good and important guidance for new believers. We may not have followed them perfectly, but it was our desire to do so. The Spirit was leading us into the fullness of the truth as we prayed and studied His Word and attended church services. But being filled with the Spirit of God, we become free to allow Him to reign in our lives and live through us to the fullest extent. Holiness cannot be brought about by a checklist. The law couldn't do it in the Old Testament, and the doctrine of the church cannot do it now. But the Spirit within us will live out God's perfect will through us if we'll allow Him to do so. Righteousness will be the only possible end result. Our lives will bring glory to God and draw lost souls to Him. This is the nature of the child of God who is truly sold out to the Savior. Discipline remains for those who still need guidance in hopes that they will, do, they will soon reach that higher plane of existence with God and lead others to it as well, continuing the cycle. I do want to mention the conclusion. This, uh, this lesson was apparently written back when the church came out of the former organization. And I believe it opens doors to people to think it's okay to resist government. It is not okay to resist the government of the church of God unless they are clearly in an apostate state. We don't get to choose what's an apostate state. We must look to the Word of God. If the Word of God says it, then it's not right. Clearly those who, who crucified Jesus, they weren't following the law. But we need to understand that we don't get to pick, well, I don't like the way this person is doing it, so that's not the government of God. That's not the way the government works. We don't have to like the choices that the government makes for it to remain the government of God. As long as the government is following the Word of God, it's our responsibility to submit ourselves to it. There are no other options. Even with the government, it's not a democracy. It's not a, this is a kingdom, not a democracy. We don't get to say, we don't get to elect our pastor. There are some churches that actually elect their pastor. We don't elect our pastor. God places them in. We don't get to kick them out when we don't like them. We don't get to ignore them. I've heard people say, well, I'm not, I'm not paying tithes. Ministers got plenty of money. It's not hurting the minister any. You're doing God's will or not. You're not paying tithes, not hurting the minister. Hurting you. Well, I'm not doing what the pastor said because I don't like him. I'm not hurting the pastor. Hurting you. Government's placed there for our benefit. We need to understand that the government includes the things we like and the things we don't like. And there are going to be things that we don't like. But we have to submit ourselves to God. We have to keep our eyes on God. And if we do that, then not only will we be blessed, the ministry be blessed, but those lost souls who need to be here hearing these words will also be blessed. It's our responsibility. That's why there's government. 
It's not something to rebel against. It's something to recognize the importance of. Surrender ourselves to so that God's will can be done. We can be a blessing to one another and those outside the church. Jesus left his house. He commanded the porter to watch. We need to watch. First and foremost, we need to watch ourselves and make sure that we are within the will of God and not butting heads with the government because we don't like what they're doing. It's our responsibility to surrender. That's, that's what it means to be a Christian. Right? If we don't, we're only hurting ourselves. We're only destroying